السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قالوا يا أبانا ما لك لا تأمنا على يوسف وإنا له لناصحون أرسله معنا غدا يرتع ويلعب وإنا له لحافظون قال إني ليحزنني أن تذهبوا به وأخاف أن يأكله الذئب وأنتم عنه غافلون قالوا لئن أكله الذئب ونحن عصبة إنا إذا لخاسرون رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Once again, everyone, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to talk about ayahs number 11, hopefully all the way to ayah number 14. That's one scene. Uh, and I think that we can cover the lessons in it fairly comprehensively without compromising anything, inshallah ta'ala, at least to the best of my understanding. Uh, this scene is about, it, it's the story progressing from where we left off last time, meaning the brothers had a conversation among themselves and they've decided that, you know, the first suggestion was, let's just kill Yusuf and get it over with. And the other said, no, 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 well, at least let's not kill him, let's put him away somewhere far, we don't have to deal with him anymore. And then one of them came in and said, I've got a better suggestion, fine, we won't kill him, don't kill him, but we can just put him in a well on, the, on a road, on a traffic road, and it's like a ditch kind of a well, it's not really well built. And if he's just in there, some caravan eventually, some, some of the passers-by are going to run out of water and they're going to go in there and maybe they'll pick him up and that's going to be good enough for us. If, if you are bent on doing something, hell-bent on doing something, just do that and we'll get it over with. And so that's the plan that they've agreed on. And from there, they're now going to try to convince their dad to let him come along. It's clear already from what we learned before. Dad said, don't tell this dream to your brothers. That's the last thing we heard dad say. So that already makes it clear that dad's being, being protective of Yusuf and Yaqub is not just going to let Yusuf go with them anywhere. And so he's be, being more vigilant because a scheme against them is coming any moment now, right? So dad's being extra precautious and we've already been given a textual hint for that in the story. But now what seems to be the case before we read the next ayah, you have to know that in this surah, uh, a lot of the, the ayah by ayah you know, references they're not, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, this happened, then a lot happened in between, and then this next ayah is kind of the next major scene, and then there's stuff in between that hasn't been said, and then there's the next major scene. So what's in between that hasn't been said, it seems to be pretty obvious that they didn't try once. They tried multiple times to take Yusuf or to convince dad, hey, he needs to come along with us. You need to let him learn some of the chores around the house too. You know, he's getting older now, he should take some more responsibility. They're trying to come at dad with different ways to try to get Yusuf away from him so they could do what they were going to do and come up with some story, right? So, and that's not working. And they're, they're just, whatever scheme they come up with, dad turns it down and says, no, he's not going, he's not going, he's not going. So eventually, this pressure keeps building up from them and they say the following. So they say, قَالُوا يَا abana." They said, our father. Now before we even go further, usually I translate the whole ayah and then I kind of go back and go deeper. But I want to, from the beginning, help you understand some of the implications. They didn't just say, Father. Or they didn't just say, what's wrong with you? Malaka means, what's wrong with you? They said, our father. Meaning, come on, dad, you're our dad. How do you not trust us? You're our dad, we're family. It's us, come on. Can you just listen to us for once? You're our dad too, you know. All of that is inside what? Ya Abana, our dad. You know, the English translation will say, they said, our father. But nobody talks like that. That's, the, the, the English translation makes it seem emotionally disconnected. But actually, the Arabic is capturing something that I want you to appreciate. Come on, dad, you're, you're, you're our dad. Please, can you just listen to us for once? You know, and even though father knows that they've, they're you know, going to be scheming something, and they're up to no good, and he... He knows about that. He even attributed shaitan's waswasa to them. Inna shaitana lil insani mubin. Even though he knows that, he's, you know, sometimes when you, when you come at someone and pressure them, pressure them, somewhere in the back of their head, they start giving you benefit of the doubt. Yes, they do mean harm, but maybe this time not so much. Maybe this one time they are genuine. Maybe I'm too, being too judgmental. Maybe I am being overprotective. Right? And they want to chip away at that guard that dad has, that you think that we're going to hurt Yusuf, right? You think that we hate him, right? 
we don't. You're our dad. He's our brother. Come on. How could we be like that? And they're, they're being convincing to him over and over, chipping away at his, you know, his protectiveness. Because they're not going to come out and say, by the way, we were thinking of dropping him in a well. So can we have him for a little bit? They're not going to say that, right? So they're going to come out as the opposite of their intention. And this is important because even though the father intellectually, in his, in his head, he knows that these sons of mine have made up their mind to harm my, my, my young boy Yusuf in some way. And they will be making a scheme. We already talked to you in detail about that before. Even though that's the case, they are his sons at the end of the day, right? And you want to have a good opinion of your own family. So even if they're doing no good, somewhere in the back of your head, you, you tell yourself, they can't be all bad. I mean, they can't... They, nobody's that diabolical that they're telling me that they mean well and they, they still mean some harm. Maybe this one time they do just want to go hang out with him, right? And they're trying to appeal to that one ounce of benefit of the doubt that he has inside him for them. They're, they're trying to provoke that benefit of the doubt from the very beginning when they say, Ya Abana. Then, there are other ways to convince. So the first way, the tactic they used to convince him is they used that relationship and love, right? And make him feel like you're not being as fatherly to us as you should be by not listening to us. So it's kind of putting, instead of them being on the spot, it's putting dad on the spot. It's making him feel like I'm not doing enough or I'm not kind enough to my sons or I don't pay attention to them or I'm dismissing their intentions or I'm too, too quick to judge them. So he's putting him on the defensive. Then they say, malaka. That's the next words. They say, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And that's another way of making that hole that they're trying to create a little bigger. Because you know what, what good manipulative people do in, in these kinds of situations is they say things that make you feel like not something is wrong with them, but something is wrong with you. Like they flipped the script on you. Here they are doing the abuse. They're the ones lying. They're the ones scheming. They're the ones denying rights. They're the ones doing the abuse. But when it comes to what they want, they'll present themselves not as the wolves as they are, but as sheep, and then say, hey, why are you... Why are you being so protective? What, what's with all the aggression? Why are you being so judge, judgmental? I don't understand why you're being like that. And they might even shed what they call crocodile tears. Right? Crocodile tears meaning they're looking sad and upset as if you did something wrong. And you know what happens with people when they get, when they get abused by somebody? And by the way, they call themselves Uspa, right? A tough group. They call themselves that. They get away with that. But when they want to get their way and dad sees them, you're being bullies to my son or you're being mean, all of a sudden they turn into these mellow, I can't believe you think of us that way, dad. And what's wrong with you? Why would you even say that about me? And dad's like, oh, you're not a wolf, you're a little kitten. And they, then the, the guard drops, doesn't it? So this is a very powerful emotional manipulation that all of them come together and do and say, what's wrong with you? And this is important. You know, I, I wonder today as, as contemplating these ayat and studying them and discussing them with Sheikh Suhaib today also, every, I told you every detail Allah mentioned in this story, there's something for us to learn, right? And what we're learning now is these, on, in one scene, they're ready to kill a boy. And they're scheming. And at the very least, they want to leave him in the wilderness. They're ruthless. They don't care. They have no care or consideration about the abandonment they're going to do and the, cause, the damage they're going to cause to him or their dad. Or the, the, just the, the evil nature of that act. On the one hand, you see this kind of really villainous face to them. And on the other side, they can put up a face where they're so innocent and so hurt that dad's not trusting me. How could you not let me take use of? How could you not? How could you even think this of us? So they can put up a pretty good front, and that front works because sometimes they get their way by bullying. Other times they get their way by getting your pity, right? And those are both very manipulative ways to get the wrong way. But it works for people that are afraid of being bullies, or people that fear all the time. Maybe I'm being unfair. People that live with a lot of guilt, right? And a lot of times what happens is when you stand up for the right thing in a relationship, whether it's spousal or parental or children or whoever, when you stand up for the right thing, you're made to feel guilty like you're doing the wrong thing. Like you're doing something wrong. How could you be so cruel? How could you be so judgmental? How could you draw that line? It hurt me so much that you drew this fair line. They're not going to call it a fair line. They're going to say, what's wrong with you? I thought you loved me. And the I thought you loved me is inside Ya Abana. And what is wrong with you? How come you're like this? Malaka. And then they say, La ta'manna ala Yusuf. This is, 
I, I squeeze my, my, my lips as I said Lata manna like that because that's the pronunciation rule in hafs. It's actually a dhamma and you can pr- pronounce it when you're reading, even though in the mushaf, in the hafs mushaf, in the script, we read that manna and usually those of you that are familiar with tajweed, when you put a shadda on the noon, you're supposed to extend it a little bit. So the qira'a would be la ta'manna ala yusuf. The noon is super extended. But here you're not allowed to extend it. So it's la ta'manna ala yusuf. It's not ta'manna ala yusuf. And that's because it's doing, it's, it's fusing a dhamma inside it. Now you can pronounce it with a dhamma, that's a correct tra- recitation of it, which is la ta'manuna, ta'manuna ala yusuf. Or you can just make the, the, the facial expression of a dhamma without saying the dhamma. So la ta'manna ala yusuf, like that, just to, to make the dhamma without pronouncing it. That's how it's also done in, in the hafs reading. But anyway, the, what does it mean? You don't trust us? You don't trust us. What's wrong with you, dad? You're our father. You don't trust us with Yusuf, ala Yusuf, when it comes to Yusuf. Now that's the next tactic. Oh, so you don't trust us? Us? Seriously? And now when you do that, when you know, this is a tactic that's a really good way of making someone take their steps back even if they're taking the right step. Let me, let me show you how this works. It's pretty awesome and manipulative and evil. Don't try this at home. Okay, so <laughs> someone comes to you and says, hey, I don't think that, you know, he should go with you. Seriously? You don't trust me. Wow. You don't trust me. I see. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, as, as someone pulls that off, what are you feeling? Oh my God, I'm sorry. No, no, it's not that I don't trust you. I, no, no, I didn't mean it like that. Now, you, you get on the defensive, don't you? Because just because of, just of the way they said it? So they're actually getting their dad on the defensive, putting him, making him question, wait, should I be trusting them? Maybe they, they're right, they're so hurt. Obviously they're so hurt because they've earned my trust, but they haven't earned his trust. And so they say, you don't trust us with Yusuf? We're the ones who mean well for him. We're the ones who are looking out for him. Who protects this household? Who, brings, who, who graces the sheep so he can drink milk? Who, who takes care of the outside farm? Who does this? Who does that? We're not doing that for him? You think we're just, we just hate him? Is that what you think? Well, actually, that is what dad thinks. But he can't say that now because they put him on the spot like that. He can't make the situation more awkward. And they say, uh, The literal translation is, Without a doubt, and it is especially for him that we mean well. Nus means to have good, good opinion of someone or good intentions for someone, to look out for somebody's well-being. You know, this word was used in the story, interestingly, of, um, I, it's a parallel I didn't describe when I was describing the parallels of Musa and Yusuf. Musa alayhi was trying to escape. And when he was trying to escape, his actual genuine friend told him, you need to get out of here. You need to run, right? And when he told him to run, he said, inni laka minan nasihin. I'm from among those who mean well for you. Same word. And now they're saying, let him come along with us. We mean well for him. So you've got a contrast between someone who genuinely means well and someone who's claiming to mean well but actually means harm, right? So he, here he say to the, they say to the father, you know, inna lahu la nasirun. Come on, dad. Obviously, we're we're well wishers for him. He's our little brother. He's our baby. We're gonna take care of him. Why, how come you never trust him with us? And then this trust him with us, trust him with us to go outside, trust him with us to go to the woods, trust him with us to go to work, whatever. You don't trust me. You don't trust us. You don't trust us. You don't trust us. But they say, come on, at least give us one chance, okay? Just one time. So you'll see that this is all in your head. You're just paranoid. So what do they say? Arsilhu ma'ana. Let him come with us. Just at least let him come with us. It, almost suggesting. Ghadan, tomorrow morning. Can you just let him come just tomorrow? Okay, you know what? Fine. Don't let him come with us to the farm and to do the work and do everything else. But this one time we're going to go. It's going to be great. We're going to do our work. And there's a lot of you know, fruits to eat there and things to enjoy. So can we, have, can we let the kid have a little fun please? Instead of just making him think his brothers hate him, arsilhu ma'ana ghadan. Send him with us tomorrow. Yarta wa yalab. Send him with us tomorrow so that he may. Now, there's several translations possible here. I'll go with the obvious one first. That's in the Hafs reading uh, that you see in the Mus'haf. And that is send him with us tomorrow. He'll eat to his fill. He'll enjoy eating food. He's gonna, you know, he's gonna snack on whatever he wants. Rata'a is used when cows eat. Right, And the idea is it's used for people when they're grazing like a cow, meaning they're just chowing things down. 
he's going to have so much fun, Dad. We're going to have hot dogs and barbecue chicken. And there's going to be, and, you know, there's fresh fruits to pick. And there's we're taking orange juice, this or that or the other. Dad, he's going to go crazy with food. It's going to be so much fun for him. He's going to love the food there. Now, they're, they're selling it. So they don't just say he's going to eat. They say, Yarta, he's going to eat like a cow grazing. Like he's going to stuff his face would be a translation <laughs> of this ayah. Let it, he, it's going to be the time of his life. And on top of that, and he's going to play. He's going to get to, he's always here. He's always, you know, sitting around. So let him come out and play a little. He needs a little exercise. So now all of this is them making a pretty good pitch for why dad should let him go. And we already know dad has his reservations, but dad's defenses are starting to come down. Like maybe they do just want to have a picnic this once. Maybe they're not going to do... I mean, they, if they would have done something, maybe they would have done it by now. They haven't done anything for so long. So maybe they don't feel the same way anymore. Maybe they're having a change of heart. Because, you know, don't you want your kids to have a change of heart if they have spite towards each other? If all of a sudden one of your kids comes along and says, you know what, Dad? And they give, they're usually fighting each other and you, give, you watch them give each other a hug. And you're like, oh, that felt nice. Because you want that to happen, right? As a parent, you want to see that reality. And they're feeding their dad what they know he wants to see. That their brother, the brothers are not looking to harm their little baby brother Yusuf, but rather to look out for him and to have him enjoy and to be his actual brothers. That's something that he really wants to see. So he's, his guard is at its lowest. And he might, he might just let them slip by with this. And they say, يَرْتَعْ وَيَلْعَبْ Now there are other meanings of يَرْتَعْ وَيَلْعَبْ based on different qira'at of it. So one of the qira'at of it is, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah also narrates this, Narta'i wa yal'ab. Now that's a different translation. Narta'i wa yal'ab would mean, we're going to do the grazing, we'll take the, because it's not yarta' with a sukun, if it's yarta' with a sukun, rata'a means to eat like an animal, like a cow, remember? But if you say narta'i with a kasra, two things change, the ya is pronounced a noon now, and the, the end has a kasra. If you pronounce it that way, that actually means we're going to go grazing. It's from ra'i, ra'a, ra'a yar'a, to graze animals. So we're going to go graze the animals. We're going to go take care of the flock of sheep while he can play. So we're not going to be preoccupied with him anyway. We got work to do, Dad. But I mean, it's a good opportunity for him to come along and to have some fun. So this, this second translation is not he will eat and play, but we'll do the work while he plays. Okay, so that's another kind of case that they made. Another is yarta'i wa yal'ab. You know what, Dad? I think you should come along with us because he will learn how to graze along with us. He'll, he'll graze and he'll play. Meaning he should learn some of these responsibilities too. I get that he's little, but he's getting older and we could use a helping hand. He should come along and pick up these skills like, you know, grazing sheep. And then he can also play. And by the way, when you talk about grazing sheep or herding sheep, right? Taking a flock out. Then obviously for any shepherd, what's the danger all the time? A wolf, right? So there's no surprise that a wolf is coming, right? So from these meanings, you can see why the wolf is connected. Another interpretation of this, this is narta wa nala. We're all, we're all going to just have a good time eating. And we're all going to play together. Not just that he'll play by himself, we'll play with him too. Which is now playing on dad's emotions. Wow, you guys are going to sit with him and eat with him? You're going to eat and enjoy watching him eat? And you're going to include him in the games you play? So he's not just going to play by himself, you're going to play with him too. And then they say, inna lahu la hafidun. And we are, we are the ones that are absolute, we're the ones that truly are his guardians. We're the ones that are going to protect him. Which, what that means is, when he goes out there, obviously we'll watch over him. We're going to make sure that he stays safe. And they're also saying, by the way, dad, we're always watching over for him. I don't think you see it, but we're always protective of him. And we're going to be like we always are. So they said two things, we mean well for him. And we're guarding over him, right? Now here's the fun thing about these two facts that they made. First of all, they made a really good sales pitch and they made themselves look, present themselves with the exact opposite intentions of what they carry, right? And they did a really good job of doing that. But also they spoke about their intentions. They said, we mean well for him and we're protective of him, right? And you can do that. You can say those things with such emphasis. Inna lahu lanasihun. Inna lahu lahafidun. We're the ones guarding over him. Without a doubt, we're the ones that mean well for him. You could say it with so much emphasis and emotion 
because all you have is words, your actions go to the contrary. And here's what happened, what's happening from the dad's point of view. The dad knows you don't mean well for him. The dad knows you're not protective of him. But the passion with which you speak makes him question his own experience. Makes him question his own experience. And that's what really good manipulative people are good at. Their actions can speak to the contrary, but their words and their tears and the sincerity in their voice and the crack in their sounds and the drama that they can put together is so convincing that you're like, yes, I have seen to the contrary. I have seen you do the exact opposite, but I'm willing to erase all of that from my mind because of this, you know, Oscar winning performance you just put up. It even convinced me. I'm convinced that what I saw, I didn't see. I'm convinced that I, what I've experienced from you, I have not experienced because your tears are so amazing. You're, the, the, how can that voice be a liar? How can those sounds be lies? You see, the, the power of manipulation, the power of Im, the, the mind games, emotional games, and that's what they're playing with their father. Now we know the father is wise, but what we're learning also here is you could be as wise as a prophet, but when somebody's playing games, it's very easy to fall into these emotional and psychological traps. Like anybody can, these games are not small, they're very elaborate games. And you can get caught up in them even if you're super smart. You could be a psychologist or psychiatrist, it doesn't matter. You can get wrapped up in psychological games. You can be, you can be the smartest person in the world and you're dealing with someone who doesn't even have, didn't even go to third grade, but they know how to play mind games and they can run circles around you even though you've been in school for 20 years. Doesn't matter. This is not about education or knowledge. This is about the power to emotionally manipulate and to use the right words in the right circumstances to get people to feel what you want them to feel, to let, get them to drop their guard, to shape their, you know, they, they already want their dad to have a certain opinion of them. We talked about that yesterday, right? Now this is about that kind of manipulation. So I do believe these ayat are very critical. They're not just about going in the park and playing or eating and playing. They're about manipulating a prophet's emotions who's already on guard and yet his guard is dropping down. Now this becomes you know, a million times easier for you and me to relate to how many times you might find yourself in a situation where someone is claiming to mean well while you know better already. You've experienced worse and worse and worse, but their words are the exact opposite of what they're painting. Every time. And then, they, then you fall for it and they do it again. And then you're in the same position again and you're upset. And when you're upset, they'll come to you and say, why are you angry like this? Why, why are you being so upset? Well, you don't realize that I love you? Is that what it is? And you're upset? After everything? And then you try to remind them of what happened or what they did. No, you, you misunderstood all of those things. Clearly, you don't even understand my intentions. Clearly, you don't know my heart. And you're going to hold on to things that didn't even count. And you're like, you're just, you get so duped and eventually there's two ways out of there's only one way out of that you're right I'm sorry and you start being the one that apologizes you're the one that goes down you're the one that drops their guard what does the father do? it doesn't say it doesn't say directly but it seems the father said okay fine just tomorrow He's, he gave in he didn't say you can be with him all the time just for one this one time which is when? tomorrow yeah? But the moment he said, okay, I said, thanks, dad, you won't regret it, thanks. And like, some of them were like, ugh. And some of them maybe went, ugh. <laughs> I don't know. But whatever they did, dad realized this was not a good thing. I know I said yes, but I regret it. And you might find yourself in a situation like that. You got emotionally manipulated into saying yes to something or to carrying on with something that you don't want carried on anymore. And the moment you said yes, you realized, oh, I, did, I stepped in it, didn't I? Here we go again, isn't it? Oh no, what have I just done? And instead of being happy, because you're supposed to be, oh, things are not going to be that way anymore. Everything's going to be different now. No, you already know better. And the moment you, you gave in, before anything else has already happened, the sadness has dawned over you. You're already sad because you fell for it again. And even though they haven't let you down already, something in you is telling you it's coming. It's already coming. And you can't believe that you gave in. So look at the words of Yaqub alayhi salam. It is profoundly psychological. He says, قَالَ إِنِّي لَيَحْزُنُنِي أَن تَذْهَبُوا بِهِ He said, it is without a doubt, it makes me so truly sad that you're, you're taking him away. 
it, ta- it makes me so sad that you're taking him away. In other words, that you are taking him away. Doesn't that mean that the decision to take him away has already been done? Right? And you know what? The, the, the emotion that he expresses is which one? Sadness. Sadness that you're taking him away. And then he says, وَأَخَافُ أَنْ يَأْكُلَهُ الذِّئْبُ And I'm afraid that the wolf will eat him. And then he says a third thing, وَأَنْتُمْ عَنْهُ غَافِلُونَ While you are going to be unaware, you're not going to be paying attention to him while a wolf comes in, the wolf comes and eats him. So there are three things here. It makes me sad that you're taking him away. And then the second thing is, I'm afraid that a wolf is going to eat him. So you've got two feelings now, sad and afraid, yes? And in that order, sad and then afraid. Now, if you just do a surface reading of this ayah, and you say first thing he felt was sad, second thing he felt was Afraid. The problem with that is sadness never happens about something that hasn't happened yet. Sadness by definition, Arabic definition and common sense definition. Sadness happens when something's already happened. Something bad happened and you're sad. You're not sad about what's going to happen next year. You're going to be afraid about what's going to happen next year. You could be sad that you got a bad grade. But that's after you got the bad grade. But you can be afraid that you're going to get a bad grade before the test. Right? So before the, the thing you fear happens, there's fear. Before there's fear, after there's sadness. Okay? A mother says, I, don't go on the motorcycle. I'm afraid you'll get in an accident. Before he gets on the motorcycle, she has what? Fear. If he got into an accident and got hurt, and you know he's in the hospital and all that stuff, and it's been a few weeks and he's in recovery, what's the mom feeling all that time? Sadness. So before the event is fear, after the event is? Sadness, but this is reversed. He says, I'm sad that you're taking him away. And then he says, I'm afraid that a wolf will eat him. I, none of this has happened yet, so this should all be about the future. So the word sad shouldn't even occur, technically, if we're reading it that way. But Allah puts sad here first. And then he put fear. And by the way, in the Quran, you find the reverse sequence most of the time. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. You must have read this a bajillion times. There's no fear on them and they shall not grieve. You heard this phrase before? There's no fear and they won't be sad? Yeah, fear of the future. And when it's all said and done, and they had nothing to fear, there won't be any looking back and being sad. That's, it's logical. Because first is fear and then there's sadness. But here it's sadness and then fear. So how do we deconstruct that? Allahu A'lam, my, my reading of this, and, I, and I, I felt more confident in that reading of it when I shared it with Sheikh Suhaib, and he sort of said, wow, I can't believe I didn't see that before. It's so obvious. But alhamdulillah, okay, was, at least I felt it was obvious to myself, and now I have at least one partner in crime. And that is as follows. Do you know what duality means? Some of you might know what duality means. Duality means when someone says one thing, but they mean two things by it. Right? There's double meaning to what they're saying. Right? So, there's a conversation about, oh, let's take Yusuf, can we take him tomorrow? He's going to play, he's going to eat food, enjoy himself, he's going to learn to grace, all that conversation, Yeah? And dad says, it makes me so sad that you want to take him away. But he's not just saying you want to take him away tomorrow. He's also saying it makes me so sad that you boys have such a hatred towards your brother that I'm always worried that you're going to what? Take him away. You're spite of him. You just want him gone. You want to literally take him away, to do away with him. Actually, ذَهَبَ bihi, you can translate as do away with him. It's a phrase used in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, you know, وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَذَهَبَ بِسَمْعِهِمْ وَأَبْصَارِهِمْ If Allah wanted, He could have done away with their, with their eyes. Meaning, He could have done away with their ability to see. To do away with something. So it doesn't just mean, it makes me sad that you're taking him away to the fields or to the mountains. It also means, it makes me sad that you just want to do away with him. He's saying both things at the same time. And that's been a reality, right? He's known that they want to do away with him. And that's what makes him sad, that his own brothers want to get rid of him. And he's agreed to let him go tomorrow, but he's, that fear, that, that overarching fear that's always been there, it's not disappeared. That, that sadness that, how can brothers be like this towards brothers? And that sadness is now going to evolve into fear. Why? Yes, I've always been sad that you had this ill intention of your brother to do away with him. But you know what I'm really afraid of? I'm afraid that when he goes out there, the wolf will eat him. Now, what in the world are we doing with the wolf? It should be a wolf or some wolf, right? The wolf, it could be ism jins, which could mean a pack of wolves will eat him. That could, mean, that could be the meaning too. But here's a few things. Shepherds, back in the day, when you have shepherds, 
they know which areas are more dangerous for the attack of a wolf. And it's not hundreds of wolves, it's a small pack or a lone wolf or whatever, and they've maybe knocked a tooth or one or two teeth or hit him in the eye or something with a slingshot or a bow arrow or a stick or something before. So they know the wolf that causes trouble. They, it's a known entity. It's not like some unseen creature from before. These are people that live, live out in the wilderness, so they've seen that wolf before. You see what I'm saying? So they know. So he's, he, there, there may be, one reading is there may be a notorious wolf in the area that's been known to nab sheep or whatever, and he's attacked small children too, because wolves don't attack humans unless they're smaller prey. Right? So that's maybe one reading of it, that he's afraid that the wolf will eat him. But I still hold the view that just like the first thing he said had duality, two meanings, I, it's making me sad that you're taking him tomorrow, but more importantly, it makes me sad that you just want to do away with him all this time. Just like that, this second fear also has two meanings. And it could mean that he, he's calling them wolves. That the wolf, or there's a wolf inside you, meaning that the whisper of the devil can be so strong. That, what does a wolf want to do? It wants to devour a prey that can't defend itself. You know that, right? Wolves don't go after animals that can defend themselves. Wolves go after animals that cannot defend themselves. Wolves, when they, when they hunt a, you know, a pack of, of gazelles or whatever else, they, they'll have one circling around or running after them to keep an eye on which one's the slowest one or the oldest one. Like they'll find the weak link and then they'll let the rest run away and go after that weak one and then pounce on him. Do you see a parallel? Do you see a connection with what's happening here? A child who can't defend himself, easily pounced on, you know, and that, obviously wolves prefer easy prey, which is smaller size prey because they can't run away and it's easy to kill and it's not as muscular or big that it can kick them off. So children used to be easy, even though they don't like to hunt human beings or attack humans, they, humans can become prey if they're smaller sized, right? But the imagery here is as if, you know, already one of them or more had suggested kill Yusuf. Kill the child, right? And he's like, Maybe some of you have that intention. Maybe you have a wolf inside you that is going to consume him. And maybe the wolf could be an allegorical reference to the devil because the devil is the ultimate enemy. Inna shaytana lil insani adu mubin. And you know how, you know, he, there's this imagery of shepherd and sheep and the attack of the wolf and all of that. You're claiming to be shepherds, but you're actually the, the wolf. You know, and I'm afraid of that. But he wouldn't come out and say to them, I'm afraid that you're the wolves that are going to eat him that are going to kill him. He's speaking in indirect terms. Now the question arises, why is he speaking in indirect terms? He's speaking in indirect terms because clearly they are going to become ultra-aggressive and they might, be, if they're called out in this way, they might not have to hide behind the entire drama of we mean well for him or this and that. They'd be like, you know what? Forget it. I'm done pretending. I'm going to kill him right now. Because they, they're that psychotic. He, he sees it. So he's afraid now to speak so directly to them that the crazy might really come out. And so he's speaking in imagery terms, it makes me sad that you want to do away with him or that you are to do away with him or, to, or in the more immediate sense, take him away and I'm afraid that the wolf will eat him. Clearly, if this was the fear, he would have said it before. But now he, he's speaking in, in, in both terms and then we get to the final phrase, وَأَنْتُمْ عَنْهُ غَافِلُونَ While you are unaware of him. So the... The picture he's painting is, you guys are going to be busy grazing sheep. He's going to be by himself eating. A wolf will see him alone and attack him. And you guys will be too busy and he'll just get devoured. Right? وَأَنْتُمْ عَنْهُ غَافِلُونَ And you won't be paying attention to him. Or you won't, you'll be unaware of who, where he is or who he is. Or, or, or what he's doing. But the second meaning, the duality in the text. So beautiful. The wolf might eat him while you never realized who he really is. To be ghafil of someone, you're unaware of who they are. And it's as if he's saying, you have so much spite for your brother. You want to do away with him. You're even, you might even be willing to kill him. And all of this, you know why? Because you don't really know who he is, do you? You just hate him and that's all, enough, all, the, all you need to know is you hate him. You just think he's the problem and that's all you need to know. You don't need to, know, to get to know him better. You don't need to understand who he is. You can remain ghafil of him and that makes your hatred easy. You can be unaware of him and that makes your hatred easy of him. So there's that duality in the text here too. And that te teaches us something very powerful. It teaches us that people that we develop hatred towards, it, it becomes easier when we don't get, give ourselves a chance to get to know them better. We don't, it gives us, it, it's a better opportunity for us to maintain that hate if we don't communicate with them directly. 
or don't give them a chance. So long as we can be blissfully unaware of what they are. Because, you know, we like to reduce people to a mistake or we like to reduce people to our opinion of them. There's, there can be no more to this person than my opinion of them. Everything else I would like to be ghafil of, that will justify my hate of them. And that's kind of almost implied inside of the text where Yaqub is saying, it makes me so sad that you're going to do this. And the wolf might eat him while you're unaware. While, you, while you're entirely unaware of him. Or you, and, and he's also in a sense saying, you don't realize who your brother really is. Now they're going to respond, and this is what I'm going to end with today. Their response, this is ayah number 14. They, they make this claim. They say, قَالُوا لَئِنْ أَكَلَهُ الذِّئْبُ وَنَحْنُ عُصْبَهُ I love this language. It makes me cry and tear up at the same time. They say, seriously? If the wolf were going to eat him while we're the band? We're the gang? Which means on the surface, what, is it, what are they saying? How can a wolf eat him when there's so many of us? Wolves will run away. But ironically, the, the, the irony in the language <laughs> is why do you need a wolf to eat him? We're here. <laughs> why do you need the... Or you, seriously, if the wolf will eat him? Well, we're around to do the, the job. Who needs a wolf? <laughs> they don't even realize what they just said. لَإِنْ أَكَلَهُ الذِّئْبُ وَنَحْنُ <laughs> but anyway, that's not their intention to say, but it's kind of a slip of the tongue almost, even you could say. But anyway, so they say, if the wolf will eat him, well, we're the gang, we're, well, we're a tight band, we in that case would be ultimate losers. Now, this also means a few things. We would be ultimate losers. Well, what are they saying? We swear we'd be losers. One, one people would say about us, these brothers that are supposed to be shepherds and fight off wolves couldn't even defend their little brother. We're going to lose our reputation if that happens, dad. People are going to consider us losers. And we're not going to get further contracts to graze other people's sheep. People are going to say, you're going to take care of my sheep? You couldn't even take care of your brother. We're going to lose our reputation. So, by the way, reputation mattered to them before, right? So that's one meaning of it. Another meaning of it is, dad, seriously, if we weren't able to defend him, while, the, while this is how many we are and we couldn't fight off the wolf, then we would have been bankrupt a long time ago. We would have been losers already because all the sheep that we have and all the grazings that we have is because we are able to fight off wolves, dad. So obviously we can defend him. And then they're also saying that another meaning of it is if we weren't able to defend him against, if the wolf did eat him, well, we're around and we're such a, a big man. Obviously we would lose respect in your eyes, dad. We would lose you. We, the ultimate loss. We would be such losers even in your eyes and your, what you think of us matters to us. You know what's crazy? That is true. What he thinks of them matters. But I want you to understand the complex psychological game that's being played. Dad, if we did that, I know how hurt you would be. And how you would never look at this the same way again. We would never do that. That's what they're telling him to convince him. While what's going on in their head is, actually that's exactly what we're going to do. And then we're going to say, remember we said we would never do that on purpose? So clearly we didn't do that on purpose. What an alibi. What an alibi. Like, how could we ever do that? That would be the worst thing because then you're, you're not going to love us like you, we hope you would. And so dad's like, yeah, you're right. You don't want that. We do, but we don't. But we do and we want to convince you that we don't. But we do. This is so psychotic. So what we're learning in this ayah is the elaborate, emphatic, passionate way in which a liar can lie. Liars can be very passionate. Angry, like offended that you question their intentions. And they can make you feel like you should question your own existence. They're so good at it. They're so like, emboldened by what they're saying. They say, Are you serious? Truly, if, if the wolf were to eat him, and we're Usma, we're a band of brothers. If that ever happened, I swear we would be the worst losers of all. Dad, how could you even think this of us? There's no way that's ever going to happen. And th th there's no way we could have survived as a household. There's no way we would let ourselves fall in your eyes. And we're not going to lose our reputation in front of people if that's the case. And it also finally means we're real losers. We, we deserve nothing if, you did that. if we did that. Then we have no, no business protecting sheep or doing any other work because we're just no good, good for nothing. We are good for nothing. And that, this is, by the way, them saying that we are, clearly we're good for something. And Dad, I don't know why you think we're good for nothing. You know, we're not useless, you know. We know what we're doing. 
And so that's the, you know, their response to their father to justify taking Yusuf a.s. Now, you know, in a, in a surface reading, you might be left with the question, how could Yusuf Yaqub a.s. let his son go when he knew that they're going to scheme? I hope I tried to explain to you today how emotional manipulation and psychological manipulation can be pretty devastating. And you could know better and still fall into it. That's the wild thing about it. You could know better, but people are good enough to mess with your head, to mess with your emotions, and get you to slip from your resolve and make choices or have them do things their way that are going to end up harming everybody. And this is, this is the willpower that is it's so difficult to hold on to, especially if there's nine of them, ten, you know, ten of them, and they're ganged up, you know, nine of them actually, ganged up, and he's just one old man, alayhi salam, and they're constantly making the same case to him, badgering him over and over again. This isn't one conversation. What we're seeing in the ayat is the culmination, the, the, the climax of maybe weeks of conversation. Maybe this is going on for a while before finally dad caved in a little and said, no, no, they mean well. Like maybe they even said, we need to play the long game here, guys. We need to show dad that we love Yusuf because he's not going to let him go like that. So we need to start being nice for a while. So his guard goes down because we're, we're in it for the long haul. This is a chess game for us. And eventually one of his guards will slip. One of, there'll be a, some chink in the armor and that's how we're going to slip in. That's exactly what the devil does, isn't it? فَدَلَّهُ مَا بِغُرُورُ he seduces people and he deludes people with a little deception at a time. One little bit at a time. So they know that they have to play the long game. Their dad's too smart otherwise. And that's what you might find yourselves in. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us from emotional manipulation and not make us of those who engage in such a thing and catch ourselves if we are doing such a thing. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikil hakim. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. No, 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 I think I'll do it. It's gonna break.